Thank you to everyone at the Havens Wright Center, and thank you all for being here uh, virtually and in person. I know it's a really crazy time for people that are starting classes this week, and I'm glad um, to be here with you. And I'm very happy to be introducing Vincent Bevins, a journalist and author whose recent book, If We Burn, The Mass Protest Decade and the Missing Revolution 2023, left a huge impression on me when I read it late last year and which we'll be speaking about today. If We Burn is a massively ambitious and important work of investigative journalism that explores the how and why of the huge movements of people taking to the streets and squares in protest that beginning in Tunisia swept the globe from 2010 to 2020. In the book, Bevins interviews hundreds of activists from 12 different countries, including Turkey, Ukraine, Egypt, South Korea, Hong Kong, Chile, and Brazil, to create a compelling, at times deeply discouraging and sometimes cautiously hopeful account of what it means that so many millions of people felt called upon, sometimes for the first times in their lives, to occupy public space, part of a collective outcry against neoliberal, ne neoliberalism and its logic of scarcity, against dictatorship or police repression and more. His book examines links among these activists, how they watched each other, citing each other's gestures and slogans, as in the book's title, If We Burn, a circulation made possible by social media platforms with their own logics of dissemination, attention, and redaction. He shows how left leaders became media icons and how left movements were defanged and at times defeated how activists grapple with movements as they travel and slip away from their grasp, and the promises and pitfalls of international solidarity today. As in his extensive piece published last month in the New York Times Magazine, Pumps of the Tropics, Brazil's Far Right, Brazil's far, far right Plots Its Return, which I recommend, uh, Bevan's work is attentive to the consolidating network of the new global right and its resuscitation of the Cold War, but also to unexpected alliances on the left. He traces with great sympathy and critical insight the limits of popular uprisings without an anchoring me mechanism, say a party, to turn the fire of passionate discontent into more durable structures to combat exploitation and the rise of neo-fascism. In this sense, he joins a growing body of intellectuals and activists, and I think of Rodrigo Nunes in Brazil, if people are familiar with his work, who are trying to think about the limits of horizontal resistance movements in light of our present world. And this to me is quite provocative and something we can all be thinking about. The question of what's next after these massive movements and their aftermath or the backlash against them. As a scholar of Brazilian culture, I'm particularly struck by the way he centers Brazil as an aperture to grapple with these pressing global problems and his ability to, to discover connections between South America and Southeast Asia, uh, both on the level of individual activists and their trajectories and on much larger geopolitical scales. His work is resolutely international. He tackles the outsized role the U.S. plays in the world, from its training of torturers and coup leaders during the Cold War in Indonesia and beyond, and this is the subject of his first book, The Jakarta Method, Washington's Anti-Communist Crusade 2020, um, to the ways in which MAGA has served as a beacon for new right figures like Bolsonaro in Brazil or Milei in Argentina or Bukele in El Salvador. But his work also decenters the U.S. in pursuit of other ways to see politics, culture, and economics. Bevins has worked as a reporter for several publications, including the LA Times, the Washington Post, and the Financial Times, and has contributed to, as I mentioned, the New York Times, uh, the Folio de São Paulo, the Nation, the Atlantic, the Guardian, and many others, and has reported from Brazil, Southeast Asia, and Venezuela. We're really happy he can be here with us in person today. So welcome, Vincent. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that introduction. And thank you to everyone for being here. I'm really grateful to be on campus here. Um, I gave a talk virtually to the university a few years ago, so I was really happy to come for the first time. So I'm really grateful for the invitation. I should also thank uh, in advance uh, of this talk, uh, Patrick Iber for a conversation we had seven years ago, um, where I basically asked him, what kind of books can journalists write that academics won't hate? Um, and he gave me really, really crucial advice because I really thought back then that number one, that no one would read this type of book or journalistic work, and two, that maybe the scholarly community would get really mad at me and never invite me to a room like this. So I'm just grateful 
simply to be here. We did not tell you. You said, <laughs> you said interviews are 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 an important thing that you do that that historians um historians historians have different skills. You have interviews and then to pay very close attention to what the scholarly output and to interact with those scholars while doing something that is different than what they do. Really it was good, yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you again. Uh, am I ready to start fiddling with my very, very uh, unprofessional slides? I apologize for the quality of my slides. I've never taught anywhere. I don't know how to use slides. I think it's the third time in my life that I've tried to put together a slide presentation. I, this process started with, with the beginning of the promotion of this book. But this talk is different than what I put together back in October. A little bit different than what I put together back um, in October 2023. Um, I've learned a little bit more about the work through conversations like this since then. And of course, there have been new developments since, since then. So it adds a little bit to what I understood back in October 2023. And it pays uh, a little more reference to, pays a little more attention to relations to the theorizations of the capitalist world system, as you might be able to garner by the subtitle there. Um, so I apologize if these are going to look goofy, but they're going to help me to get uh, to present this book. Uh, so if I go back, is this going to work? Yeah, yeah. To present this book, which is really what um, this is all about. So this, as the subtitle of the, the, the book itself indicates, this is a book uh, about mass protest. Um, I'm going to explain where that book came from and what it tries to do. Um, but even to an even larger extent than my first book, the topic here, the topic of mass protest is one that is personal to me. Um, I did not sort of choose to go looking for mass protests. One arrived literally on my doorstep um, in June 2013 in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, I was living really at the center of what became a, a, a monumentous explosion in that country. It wasn't so much the history came knocking on my doorstep, but certainly the tear gas wafted up into my flat throughout June 2013. And it was a strange and initially very exciting, but then profoundly confusing and distressing uh, set of events. So what happened, at least from my perspective in June 2013? A set of anarchists and leftists organize a series of raucous and prefigurative street demonstrations against the rise in the price of the bus fare in early June 2013. Now, this was a group, the Movimento Passi Livre, the MPL, that had been doing this kind of thing and be becoming very good at it since 2005. This group grew out of the alter globalization movement in Brazil. Many of them had worked for Indie Media Brazil. And over the eight years since their founding at the World Social Forum in Port Porto Alegre, Rodrigo Nunes, who I'm going to talk about a little bit, sorry, I mentioned his work, was influential in actually setting up, getting them the room to found their, their left autonomous um, uh, public transportation social movement. So over those eight years, whenever there was a rise in the price of the bus fare, they organized these types of demonstrations. They would block turnstiles. They would make it impossible for people to get across the city, forcing the government to pay attention and hopefully reverse uh, the rise in the price of the bus fare. Now, the first four demonstrations in June 2013, they do shut down the streets. They do make it impossible to use public transportation, but they don't get the nation on side. And when I say the nation, I mean the dominant media in Brazil, which is often known by olig oligarchs and the political class, because the only people that we're going to find out about these protests and sympathize with them, um, we're going to do so because of the media that they were consuming. So in, after four demonstrations, Brazil's dominant media call for a crackdown. They call for a, they call for the brutal repression of these, this protest. Now, if the class of journalists in Brazil, the class of people that work for the dominant media came from the sector of Brazilian society that usually experiences repression at the hands of the military police, of course, a legacy of the US backed military dictatorship, they should have understood what was coming, what a crackdown would really look like, but they didn't, and they did not expect what came. And they were so, so shocked by the crackdown, which incidentally hit journalists at this dominant media, that they flipped their, their narrative about what had happened. They went from saying, we need to clear these punks and anarchists off the streets, to saying, this is a glorious national uprising in the defense of the right to rise up or something. They couldn't really figure out why it was good, but they flipped their narrative quickly. Um, from being entirely negative to, to positive. After this national shocked reaction to the crackdown that hits the middle class, um, hundreds of thousands of people and then millions of people pour into the streets. The new people come into the streets with new ideas as to what the streets are asking for, and they enter into initially verbal but ultimately violent conflict with the original leftists. And so from June uh, 13th, 2013 to June 20th, 
this, the configuration of the stream movement changes so much that the new arrivals, the beginnings of what you would now recognize as an extreme right movement in Brazil, actually physically expel the original um, uh, left-wing protesters from the street. So this, and this, the beginnings of this far-right movement in Brazil, ultimately, of course, builds into something that takes power in 2018. Um, so if you take a big, if you take a big step back, it seems like in June 2013, the Brazilian people asked for better public services and responded with disgust to police repression. But then five years later, the, the Brazil is governed by probably the most extreme right leader in the democratic world, a man who slashes public services and celebrates the police murder of civilians. So somehow or another, this went wrong. It seemed that the, the, the people of Brazil asked for one thing and got the opposite. And this not only was sort of intellectually interesting to me, this really troubled me and a lot of the other people that had lived through this reversal. Um, so in the years following, I looked around the world with a mix of anxiety and trepidation when something like this seemed to be happening somewhere else, um, as many other Brazilians did. Ukraine came right afterwards. Uh, Gezi Park in Turkey was, was happening at the same time as the uprising in Brazil. And going to the end of the decade, I, I paid close attention, watching and hoping, I hope, I, 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 watching and thinking, I hope this doesn't go the way that Brazil did. And I also came to the conclusion that 2013 in, in Brazil would not have gone the way it did if it had not been interpreted as if it were something like the Arab Spring in Brazil. So it was called very quickly the Brazilian Spring. There was, you know, because the images looked the same, there was an analogy made to what had happened in the Arab world, which is very strange because instead of dictators, we had a progressive democratically elected and at the time very popular um, president from the workers, Dilma Rousseff. So they came up with this project. I came up with the once more after, uh, actually this, this, this book project precedes the publication of the Jakarta Method, but the, the, public, the, the project I came up with once more was to write a global history, to, write, to try to tell the story of the 2010s. Now, of course, you can't actually tell the story of the world over 10 years. So this history is built around one particular phenomenon. It treats one phenomenon as if it is the most important thing to happen in that decade. I think you might as well. So I, I, the book is told as if the most important thing to happen in this decade is the protest that gets so big that it becomes something else. The phenomenon of mass protest that either overthrow governments or fundamentally destabilize existing society. So this is the bar that I created that a mass protest has to clear to, to get into the book. And like any work of history is built around a particular concern. And, and, and the question around which this history is built is how is it that so many mass protests led to the opposite of what they apparently asked for. Now the method, I'm a journalist, the method is interview. So what I did is I ran around the world, I went to 12 countries and interviewed somewhere between 200 and 250 people. Of course, also doing what Patrick suggested seven years ago, doing my best to read the scholarly literature on the topic, doing my best to reach out also to the, to the real experts, always testing the testimony offered by interviewees against the best narrative that had been put together by experts in that period. Um, this photo is members of the Movimento Spasi Livre, who end up sort of being some of the main protagonists in the book. Uh, Lucas Legumi is in the upper right corner, and that's Mayada Vivian, who spent a lot of time speaking with me. Uh, but I didn't only speak to organizers of these protests. I spoke to regular people, um, in square quotes, of course, that ended up participating in the mass protests. I spoke to people in government that found themselves in the position of having to respond to the mass protests. And I use these interviews to build a chronological history um, that incorporates their memories and their insights. And this is them back in 2013, I think, speaking to Brazil's dominant media, which is quite important because th that interaction becomes fundamental to what happens in 2013, but also to my analysis. In that bottom right corner, I didn't notice this until recently, but to the left of Mayada Vivian is Guilherme Bolos, who's now running for mayor of Sao Paulo. He's now a major figure on the Brazilian left at the time. Uh, he was in uh, leading, we still leading the MTST, the, the homeless workers team. But, so, so, so that's, that's, that was my method. Now this method of course has strengths and, limi and limitations. It, it, it means that on the positive side, that we can pay attention to split second decisions that were often so fundamental in these, in these mass protest explosions. We can pay to the, we can pay attention to the feelings and the emotions, which were also fundamental to these mass protest explosions. Now, in general, I favor big, structural, long-term explanations for historical changes. But uh, Mark Meisinger has this concept of thickened history, which allows us to understand why it is that 
in these moments of revolutionary uh, possibility, the short term can sort of play the role of the long term. A lot, something that can happen in a very short period of time can end up really mattering to the story in, in ways that it might not, might, might not otherwise. Um, of course, the weakness is that the interviewees are limited by what they saw and felt and decided. So it ends up privileging more ideas and decisions rather than the deep, deep, deep structures which may not be visible to participants, right? Like, it's going to be hard for somebody who's thought all, all day long about which street to turn left and turn right at to incorporate, say, the shift of the center of global capitalist accumulation from one region to the other or the reasons for the oil price collapse in 2014, which ultimately do, helps to doom Dilma Rousseff's um, uh, uh, campaign. So the weakness is that it really ends up being about phenomenological uh, 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 elements, but I'm a journalist, that's what I do, so everyone else can do that other stuff. Um, the answer to that question, how is it that so many mass protests, apparently the opposite, what they asked for, I think is the history itself, but for a talk like this, I think it's, it's possible to put forward a framework to explain how that question is answerable in each particular case. Now, of course, I, re I, I draw on Charles Tilley's conception of repertoires of contention. Um, in non-academic context, I often talk about a recipe of tactics. And the reason I like this recipe metaphor that actually just, just, that came out of the conversations that I've had over the last 11 months is that I'm going to indicate, you've probably already guessed, that some of the ingredients in this recipe in the, in the middle of the slide, um, sorry, the total recipe together may not work out very well. It may not taste very good. It may, but that doesn't mean you have to throw out every single element, right? You know, one, one dish may have too much butter. That doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean you never have butter again in any, uh, any dish for the rest of your life. And I think that kind of mistake, their words, uh, is, is, is one that was made by some of the organizers in, in the mass protest decade to think that because somebody in this other movement that I don't like did this, use this one tactic, I can never use that forever. So, um, Talk about repertoires of contention, talk about recipes. And what I think is really interesting from Tilly in this context is his insight that in moments of reaction to elite abuse, in moments of reaction against uh, governments, more powerful forces um, that have committed abuses against populations, people do what is familiar, or people do what they already know how to do. They don't come up with the solution that is appropriate. They come up with something that has been done in the past, they have done in the past, or they've seen somebody else do in the past. Because again, you have sort of five minutes to decide how to respond to uh, injustices committed by elites. Um, and if you trace this historically, it's very clear that they change over time. They are, they are, effected, they are affected by um, ideas and histories, right? So to build that framework to help set, that helps us to understand the question that is central to the book, my understanding is that in the 2010s, a particular repertoire of contention, a particular package of tactics became hegemonic, often appearing to be a natural even to participants, often appearing to be the way to respond to elite abuse. And that repertoire, that tactical recipe is the apparently spontaneous, leaderless, digitally coordinated, horizontally structured mass protest in public squares or public spaces, it says of, but should say, or public spaces. And they were often said to prefigure the society they meant to bring about. And it was often said that they had a floating signifier, which often meant, uh, it was often put forward po positively as this very cool sort of postmodern thing that was happening. But if you go back to this slide at the beginning, you can see, if you read these signs, people are coming out for not only different reasons, but contradictory reasons. These are, they're putting forward claims that are not only diffuse, they're mutually exclusive. So back in, in June 2013, you were really allowed to come and say whatever you wanted. You want communism, great. You want fascism, great. You want less corruption. That's you. You're all invited, right? Um, so what I think is important to say about this um, particular package uh, is that each element comes from somewhere, and there are material and ideological reasons that this package becomes dominant. Now, I tried to sketch in the book a very brief prehistory of why it comes together probably the part of the book that is easiest to contest that, I'm, that I most want to very carefully revise for a paperback edition. But what matters to me is that they all do come from somewhere. Um, human beings do not automatically, mystically come up with the correct or the most effective set of responses to um, abuse. Now, just as an example, I don't, even, even, I don't even use this work in the book, but just an example of the degree to which this 
the hegemonic nature in the 20th sense of this particular repertoire is historically contingent back in 1990, but actually before um, it became clear what was going to happen to the former Soviet Union, uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein uh, outlined six possible forms that um, anti-systemic movements can take, which correspond to the first, second, and third world, either before or after 1968. So accepting the existence of the, the world system, accepting the existence that it matters where you are, if you're in the North Atlantic or in the Soviet Union or in the Global South, um, he comes up with a very loose set of a list of the types of social movements that have historically emerged that are associated with each. So in the first world, pre-1968, you have trade unions and the social democratic parties. Second world, pretty obviously, there's Leninist party. Third world, pre-1968, national liberation movements. Post-1968, now in, in, in the first world, you have the new social movements or often protest movements put together by the new left uh, and the new social movements that take uh, shape in the 70s. In the second world after 1968, he talks about anti-bureaucratic movements. Again, this is before it becomes clear what's going to happen um, at the end of the Soviet Union, um, movements against the Soviet bureauc bureaucracy and also including Solidarnosc. And then the sixth form, which is his schematic, for, this is his, his um, summary of post-1968 third world movements is religiously inflected movements. So either Islamist revolutionary movements or like liberation theology movements, right? So the only reason I go through that long list very, very quickly is to, because it underlines to what extent this package is really associated with one of those six. It's associated with post-1968 post new social movements in the first world, rather than in all of those other uh, five historical formations or all the other theoretically possible formations uh, that an anti-systemic movement can take. Okay, so very quickly, this is, who get, this is who gets included. That image is Tucker Square in 2011. I call this the mass protest decade, but I think you really would call it if you wanted to, the Tahrir decade. To a really great extent, you saw the inspiration uh, emanating from Cairo in 2011, um, being reproduced, uh, changing what happens throughout the 2010s. But very quickly, those are all the, the cases that are in the book. And if there is a asterisk next to, next to the name of the country, it's because I concluded that ultimately, this was not a case that really there was a protest that caused the overthrow of an existing government or its fundamental destabilization. In the case of Libya, Syria, of course, it's actually military interventions that, that start to matter more than the protest movement itself. Now, trying to complete the construction of this framework, hello, <laughs> complete the construction of this framework that allows us to answer what happened in individual cases. My understanding is that this particular repertoire of contention is far more successful than anticipated, planned, or sometimes even desired at putting people on the streets. It is far, far more successful at creating huge influxes of humanity into public squares and spaces. Now, again, this, this book is built through interviews. So many, many of the interviewees told me that six hours before the protest began, certainly three days before, they had never anticipated that they were even gonna, for example, get to Tahrir Square, let alone that so many people would join the protest, let alone that they would overthrow a government, right? So this particular repertoire of contention, for a lot of reasons, material and ideological, like social media is part of the story, but less than people uh, used to say it was back in 2011, is hugely effective at generating numbers, right? But then this quantitative increase generates a qualitative shift. You get so many people on the streets that, in my understanding, these are no longer protests. You have now either revolutionary movements or you have opportunities for deep reforms. You have, I think that fundamentally all protests are communicative actions, and you get to a point where communication is not really either effective because there's no one to communicate to. Either the dictators fled, you know, jumped on a plane and fled the country, or existing elites got the message and they're saying, okay, what do you want? Please tell us what you want. You win, I want to help you, right? So there's these, this quantitative increase generates a qualitative change, which generate real, generates real opportunities of one or two types. Either there's a power vacuum, either there's no government, or there's the opportunity for deep reform in, uh, in the cases where, like in Brazil or in Turkey, the government hasn't been overthrown, but they really, they understand that they need to give something to the streets, whatever that means to the streets, uh, in order for uh, business as usual to, um, to continue. So to understand 
how in each particular case there are worse failures, partial victories, what happens. Um, my approach is to look to who does take advantage of the opportunities, who does enter the power vacuum, who is it that is ready and willing and organized enough, connected enough, ideologically coherent enough, some combination of all of the above to enter a power, power, vacuum, power vacuum, or who can take advantage of the destabilization that is forcing existing governments to come to, to look for a negotiating table, sometimes there isn't one, or to understand that things have to change or to lose power vis-a-vis uh, -vis their rivals in the political system. So I've already sort of hinted at this, but often who takes, you know, an exam some examples of who does take advantage of these um, opportunities are existing elites. Um, you know, sometimes you see a, a kind of a game of mus musical chairs effected between different ruling parties. You see that one guy or one guy and his, his, uh, his crew are forced to leave the scene, but then the other people enter the scene. You have reactionary movements, movements that are coherent and ready to act. And this is the case of the far right in Ukraine in 2013, 2014. It's a mistake, of course, to, to say that Euromaidan is or ever or has, is a far right movement or has uh, an, uh, an outcome in which the far right wins. But I think they punch above their weight because they are good at this type of street contention and they are organized and willing to act. So you get them playing some role in effecting the final outcome when they should probably have none, not only because they're morally uh, abhorrent, but because of they really represent almost no one in Ukrainian society in 2013 and 2014. Uh, and then you get imperialist opportunism or imperialist counterattack. This is something that is very familiar in the long history of revolutions. If there's a, if there's a, a power vacuum, someone in the neighborhood might realize that they have the opportunity to take advantage of this, to impose their will on a given country. I think NATO's response to Libya is a decent advantage of this. Or you have, um, that's imperialist opportunism, and then you have imperialist counterattack. And so this is a, an image from the Saudi-led invasion of, of Bahrain, um, in which Saudi Arabia and the rest and its partners in the GTC, GCC simply drive over the bridge and crush the, the uprising. Um, another example, and this is, again, wh where is it more or less successful? Where is there a sort of a partial victory? I look at, look at Chile. This is an image of Gabriel Boric, who came from the student protest movement of 2011. Just to, I'm sure I finished my presentation. Oh, in about 25 minutes? 25 minutes, good, good, good. And then the, the whole thing is at 2 p.m., right? Fantastic, that's perfect. Okay, so this is Gabriel Boric, who in 2011 was a student leader um, during a protest explosion uh, that year. In 2019, there is the Estadio Social, Again, like in Brazil in 2013, there are a group of young people that are blocking turnstiles, protesting the rise in the cost of public transportation. Like in Brazil, there's a crackdown. Like in Brazil, there is a, uh, well, even to, to, to a greater extent in Brazil, the government uh, is seen to be really brutal and clueless in its support for the crackdown. And there's an explosion of humanity on the streets, strikes, no one knows what to do. What happens is those representatives in Congress that did come from the student movement, Gabriel Borge being the most, most famous, um, were part of the conversation as to how to create or generate some exit ramp for the Estadio Social. Now they get together, existing elites, existing elected representatives in Chile's government, and they come up with a peace agreement, which is that, okay, if you stop doing this, we will have an, a road to a new constitution. Now at this moment, this is the moment when Boric is canceled. Borge, the streets, but really it's two guys, but the streets, but who's the streets, right? That's, that's kind of the point of uh, uh, a major point of this talk. Some members of, of the Estadio Social come up to him, pour beer on him and say, you're a traitor. You're imposing the solution from the outside. Um, and I think that in this case, just as in every case in the book, the resolution is imposed from the outside. In no case that I looked at, at least in those 12 to 14 cases that I look at, do the streets ever effect the final outcome at all? They, to some extent, can be in conversation with the people that do, but even that is often limited. The, the best outcomes are when somebody imposes a resolution on this particular form of contention that sort of understands where they're coming from. So there are ups and downs after this 
this this cancellation. After the beer is thrown on Gabriel Borg, she's called a traitor by some of the uh, leftists and anarchists in the street that particular day. A lot of people kind of accept that this is a decent resolution. People go home. This that Ilha Social doesn't disappear. It's still happening years later in some way or another, but it kind of works. He wins an election. He becomes the president of Chile. So in, in comparison to the U.S. context or many of the, certainly the other context of um, the mass explosions in my book, this is a remarkable outcome. This is somebody from the class of 2011 now leading the country. Then they fumble the constitutional reform process. They come up with a constitution that the people reject. They, many leftists, many people think, don't do a great job of governing the country. I think this is the game when you actually win power, ultimately. But this may be one of the cases in which you have the best outcome. And again, it's not the people that said the streets didn't decide this are right in every single case. It's always imposed from the outside. In other cases, like in the case of Libya, oh, that's the one. Other ones in the case of Libya, it's NATO that's deciding. Here in Saudi Arabia, sorry, and here in Bahrain, it's Saudi Arabia and GCC that are deciding. In Chile, the kind of closest to the best you get, it's that somebody that understands more or less what a neo anti neoliberal project would look like, someone that came from the protest movement, that someone understands its dynamics, now governing, trying to govern from the left, a country in the global south, confronting all the contradictions that that entails, is Gabriel Boric um, from the class of 2011. Now, another thing that happens um, is misrepresentation and appropriation of, of the legitimacy that is created by the initial explosion. So this is an article actually written by somebody I know quite well, from, uh, I think it might be 2014 or 2015. And in Brazil, this is, this is El País, and the, the headline is, this is not an indie rock band. This is the anti-Dilma vanguard. The, that choice of words is quite interesting, right? So in 2013, the MPL, the Movimento Passe Livre, the MPL, them, and actually, autonomous, horizontally structured, leaderless, grassroots, digitally coordinated movement, create the conditions for a mass revolt that everybody wants to get their hands on. Everybody wants to redirect. Everybody wants to be involved in. These kids, some of which that have been trained in the United States by the Cook brothers, receive funding from the Atlas. Well, they all, they all receive hey. money from the Atlas uh, institution, uh, the think tank, uh, like mega think tank, Octopus based in Washington, D.C. Uh, Camila Hosha calls it the neoliberal common term. They realize correctly in 2013 that the streets are up for grabs. So they, because they can't use their, their existing student movement to organize protests because it receives funding from the United States, they create a new one and they try to copy the name of the kids that had actually been risking their lives for eight years fighting cops and creating um, generating so much sympathy across the, the population. This works to the point where when I go back to Brazil in 2021 to ask people, you know, people ask me, oh, what are you doing? I'm working on a book. And they're like, oh, well, what are you doing right now? I would say, well, I'm interviewing members of the MPL. The MPL has disappeared from the political scene to such an extent that everybody assumed I said MBL because the, the acronyms sound the same, which was the whole point from the beginning. The MBL helps to lead a protest movement being very intentional about interacting with the media, pretending to be autonomous, grassroots, leaderless, digitally coordinated, where really they're, they know exactly what they want. They want to transform the state. They want to destroy aspects of the, uh, the welfare state. They're willing to take money from uh, foreign uh, uh, actors and from local elites. And they are willing to put themselves forward as a vanguard of this protest movement. To the extent that that's true, more or less, but the media by it, it some kind of, somehow becomes true. Um, but, and then by 2018, they campaigned for Jair Bolsonaro and entered Cong Congress alongside him. So uh, King, Kim, King you know, on the left, it's now in Congress. Uh, uh, this is now, you know, they've fallen away a little bit in the post Bolsonaro era, but they become a real political force. This bid to appropriate, to contest the significance of June 2013 works. Um, and this is something that you have across, again, what I call the mass protest decade. You have a similar uh, process in Egypt. Of course, in 2011, you have a group of protesters that put together a demonstration against police violence um, in January 2011. They were a group of people that had been demonstrating 
in favor of Palestine against U.S. imperialism since the beginning of the 21st century. They had always understood that they're, um, they had always understood that a movement for democracy in Egypt would necessarily entail challenges to U.S. backed um, the 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 uh, regional powers backed by the U.S. Um, um, in the Arab world, that is Israel and Saudi Arabia. They always understood their movement to be anti-imperialist. So they were very shocked when sort of CNN showed up and said, oh, they want to join America in, like, in the B team. You know, they, they want to integrate themselves into the world system um, as junior partners of the United States. So that's 2011, but they generate huge waves of sympathy in Egypt. In 2013, you have a movement like this. It's called Tamarod. They pretend to be a grassroots organization calling for uh, 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 petition signatures to overthrow Mohammed Morsi. Actually, we find out later, oh, they're funded by the UAE. The whole thing was set up so that there could be a coup to put in CC. And that's the situation Egyptians are still facing to this day. A dictatorship, which as many organizers of 2011 would say, worse than the one that they overthrew uh, initially. So that's just a quick, <laughs> uh, that's, that's three examples of how you can use that framework to answer the question of who does take advantage of these opportunities? In no case is it the, is it the original organizers. And the degree to which it's a success or failure depends on who that is. Um, maybe they're your enemies, maybe they're kind of your friends. But certainly by 2020, a really brutal lesson emerges. Um, if it's not already clear, I'll make it explicit. There's absolutely no guarantee that a mass revolt of this type led by progressives or making progressive demands will lead to a progressive outcome. Um, they may actually, uh, in the words of Vladimir Shchenko and Oleg uh, Zarovlev, Zerov, I think that's right, um, reproduce and, in, and intensify the crisis of representation to which they're trying to respond. They may actually underline and make deeper the crisis of representation um, at the national level, but which is, I think, uh, uh, symptomatic of our moment in the global system at this moment, at, at, at this time. Um, and what's really interesting about their pessimistic analysis is Vladimir's Ukrainian, is that in this scheme that I've created, Euromaidan has actually a decent outcome. They do better than most. I, I, I call it sort of a mixed success. Like there are participants in Euromaidan that say, yes, we got what we, we asked for. A lot of people will say, no, we didn't. A lot of people felt very excluded by the final outcome not the moment where everybody was allowed to sort of show up and put forward their own demands, but a lot of people felt excited by the final outcome. But overall, this is, a, this is an analysis that comes from people, uh, that comes from a region where actually it was kind of a mixed bag, I think. Um, again, now this is back to my understanding that this form, this very particular recipe, generates effective destabilization. It's like a big red button you can, it's like destabilize. That's what you got. But with an, without analysis of the surrounding conditions, or additional elements that are prepared to act after the opportunities arise, it kind of amounts to a crapshoot. And I like that, uh, that figure of speech of the crapshoot, because I think in this case, the house usually wins. The house tends to win. It tends to be pre-existing power structures that take advantage of the opportunities rather than the people, as um, the organizers of the mass protests now might um, understand them, or certainly those organizers themselves, which leads me to ask whether or not many of these anti-systemic movements in the 2010s actually adopted formations that are pro-systemic, that tend to tend towards pro-systemic outcomes. Um, now, what would that mean and why would that be? Why would that be possible? So if you accept my kind of spatial metaphor of the creation of a power vacuum or the creation of opportunities, uh, when existing elites uh, 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 are disrupted. If you are, especially in the global south, it is often very, very likely that dominant structures outside of the country will pour in and fill that power vacuum more quickly than you'd be able to put together sort of uh, working class power structures or, or social movements for progressive structures that be able to take that, take, um, take advantage of those opportunities. Now that's always the case, but I think it tends to be the case. Um, so if indeed what you want is the larger global system to pour into a hole that you create with your explosion, then this is maybe an appropriate and sufficient formation. And the reason I have Berlin 1989 there is because whether or not we agree, and, and I think, yeah, and I chose a photo of somebody wa waving the flag of the FRG because ultimately what happens is 
East Germany joins the FRG, right? Like you don't get a you don't get a, a mixing, you don't get a dialectical resolution. You get the FRG pouring into the vacuum that is left by the the collapse of of East Germany. So empirically, historically, a lot of people in the GDR were not asking for that. But if that was what you wanted, if what you wanted was the more powerful dominant, uh, the more, more powerful country next door to pour into the power vacuum, if you wanted the world system as it is presently constituted to sort of just get rid of this intermediate layer that's stopping it from coming into your country, then just knocking existing elites out of the way may be all, need, all that you need to do. If indeed you just want to join West Germany, that just pressing a button that destroys the GDR might be the case. Now, the rest of the post-Soviet, well, the rest of the post-Soviet and post-Warsaw Pact world did not get a very rich democratic country investing huge, of money, huge amounts of money to integrate it into its economy. It was left with some devices. You got the rise of oligarchs that just seized assets that were available because of the disintegration of the Soviet economy. You did not get, you got integration into the, I think, what is the real global system, but you didn't get integration into the first world. You got integration in the global system in the way that weak states often are integrated. You have existing elites selling off um, the, the products of extractive um, uh, capitalist firms to the first world, and you get um, underdevelopment. So this, once more, okay, okay, okay. So this one, you know, this is a question that I'm putting forward. Um, if it is that this, if it is the case that this particular recipe, this particular formation, is tends to be pro systemic and also that it can be adopted by movements that in their content, in their desires, are anti-systemic, that raises a few questions. One is it, one is the, is why is it and how is it that a particular set of tactics, you know, very loosely um, associated with the post-1968 first world end up becoming dominant everywhere in the global system, at least in the 2010s, or at least um, um, when it comes to this particular type of revolt, um, how is it, why is it that you, you had six, and, and back then Wallerstein was saying that, you, that there was mixing and matching always happening, you know, even after the new social formations emerged, you still had, you know, the Labour Party and the United Kingdom, you still have the trade union movement. Why is it the case that this becomes adopted uh, throughout the world? I think another question to ask is what it was exactly that the new social movements in the first world achieved. I think certainly some things, but what was it? And to what extent is the United States specifically, but um, the first world in general, but really the United States specifically distinct? To what extent do we play by a different set of rules? Because there is no, we're the only country in the global system that doesn't have a more powerful state that will take advantage of destabilization. There's no way you can imagine, at least right now, that creating destabilization in the US government or uh, overthrowing the US. I don't think that's what could happen in the near term. But there, you can't imagine a more powerful state taking advantage of that um, situation and imposing a, a, a resolution on it because there is no more powerful state. So to what extent do the emergence of these tactics depend on the context of the first world? And why is it that, that they became dominant in, in the 2010s? And then also this helps us perhaps understand why since then there have been varying understandings of, at, you know, depending on where this is happening, Will you get support from various power structures, existing um, powerful states, and other states act horrified and say, you absolutely cannot do this. This is going to ruin everything. I mean, if you look at the way the US acts, it often has to do with whether or not they believe their enemy is going to be hurt by this, rather than not whether or not they're progressive, right? And then drawing on what Wallerstein had said back in 1990, another final question is, well, how is it possible then to mix and, mass, max, mix, mix and match these various tactics? Um, because as I said earlier in the talk, a lot of my interviewees did say that they believe that their movement sort of threw various babies out with lots of different sets of fat waters. That they had been so committed to rejecting a particular organizational form that they did things that would have been useful for them just because that that had been done by some historical formation that they didn't like. And we also learned by the end of the 2010s, I mean, it's not in the talk, but by the end of the 2010s, it became very clear that like, you don't have to be progressive to do this. Right, like to do a mass, apparently spontaneous revolt, um, all you need is to want to do it. Like uh, by the end of the 2010s, from in Brazil, in the Brazilian context, from uh, 1965 to um, 
2013, the left had always assumed that the streets belonged to the left. They just, as a matter of course, like the streets are ours. Anything that happens in the streets is progressive. Um, the NPL sort of bet um, a lot on this deep understanding. And then by the end of the 2010s, actually, they were really, everyone was afraid of the streets to the point where during the Bolsonaro era, people didn't want to go to the streets because they were shocked. They were so traumatized by what had happened. They believed that the right was likely to win street contestation. Um, so yeah, those, that, that, those are all questions that are raised by my hypothesis here. Um, but I think one of one part of the answer has to be, I think, the role of media. And this is something, of course, I play a lot of attention to myself because I'm a journalist. I was really there in those rooms as the Brazilian media went from deciding, went from thinking we need to crush this to this is great. Um, going back to, you know, at least I'll give one's account of the early 1960s, it was clear that this particular type of mass protest was vulnerable to media misrepresentation. Um, and what we saw in the 2010s is not only an intensification of the mediatization of our lives, like we're always all like not only consuming media, we're more mediated than ever, not in the sense of um, being part of an organization which mediates between, say that's often falling apart, but we're always thinking about what's going to be on media. And if you, I look at, I think if you look at the deep, the long history of protests, protests only emerged in the first place because of media representation. And so in the 2010s, you saw a, a, a process accelerate by which you, images could um, spread around the world. People could copy things elsewhere. People could be inspired by things elsewhere. And also, um, that provides the raw material for traditional media, oligarch owned in the case of many of Brazilian uh, outlets or with particular ideological orientations like the corporate media in the United States to see something somewhere and kind of see what they want to see. Because it looks like, okay, this is Arab Spring. You know, again, in Egypt, a lot of people said, oh yeah, they're doing the Berlin Wall because it looks the same to me. Um, and of course, I think digital media is a part of the story. So a lot of my interviewees came to the conclusion this particular form was is especially vulnerable to media misrepresentation. And what I found is that Media, the imposition of representation, I already talked about the imposition of outcome from the outside, but the imposition of representation uh, onto uh, diffuse and often contradictory street movements not only changed the way that the rest of the world understood what was happening over there, they changed the thing. They changed the actual conf configurations of power on the streets, Brazil being one example, because the Brazilian media said, oh, this is a patriotic uprising in defense of kind of like Facebook uncle, common sense, political demands. Those type of people showed up with those, that understanding. And when the original protester says, no, it's not, they're like, well, yeah, it is. You don't have to, I don't, I don't have to listen to you. And I saw this happen, played, I saw this played out many times in front of me. The new arrival said, leave me alone. I don't have to listen to you. I don't care about your left wing uh, bullshit. So um, what, that is one of the answers that uh, my interviewees come up with at the end of the book. As I said, it's a book of interviews. I also asked them at the end of the decade how their views have changed, what they might have wanted to do differently, how, um, what they think they learned, what they think they would pass on to future generations. And again, this is all very um, subjective and based on the selection of who I spoke to. But very quickly, broadly speaking, there's a turn to a return to some kind of structure, uh, the appreciation that some kind of a pre-existing organization or some kind of a structure that can exist in the long term is necessary for getting the best out of these moments of opportunity. Suspicion of spontaneity, which I think isn't real. I don't think human beings ever really, really do anything spontaneously. They might do something quickly. They might decide to do it in 10 minutes rather than in a meeting of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. But it's, there's always a reason. Uh, Rodrigo Nunes is very good on tracing the way, yeah, um, Sarah already mentioned him, Brazilian philosopher, tracing the ways that often spontaneity meant in the history of the left, just inside or outside the party. But whatever it is, whatever sus suspicion of uh, spontaneity does mean, which usually means something that comes together quickly and is unplanned, people are less likely to think that's automatically a good thing. I think that it's often, you can't choose. History comes knocking whether you like it or not, as was the case. Um, in June 2013, but there's more suspicion of the affirmation of spontaneity for its own sake, sake, a need for a plan, even knowing that like, definitely your plan is going to be revised uh, in the struggle, but some kind of an idea of how you would extract a win from a given set of opportunities is something that many of my interviewees said. Uh, again, this suspicion of media, 
Um, the understanding that, because I, my view, and I'm, this is shared by many interviewees, my view is that you can only really get this particular type of phenomenon, the rapid quantitative scaling up of a mass protest event, if you get this kind of virtuous slash vicious cycle of representation in, dom in dominant and social media. You only can go from a small protest to a really, really big one if there is a sympathetic reproduction of words and images from that part of the country that only a few people can physically see with their eyes. And so my interviewees came to the, many of them came to the conclusion that this kind of thing is necessary. If you want to do that exact thing, maybe you shouldn't always do that exact thing, but you have to be also wary of the ways in which media um, are not your allies forever, especially if you're truly anti-systemic, if you actually want to change power configurations in a given country. And then the idea that finally, you don't know what's going to come. And when it comes, you're probably not gonna have time to put together one and three and independent media. So um, to build now when it seems like nothing is happening. Now, finally, very quickly, I have two minutes for this, which is good. I, was, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on this. Um, that it has become clear in the last few years, since 2020, um, that, well, of course I believe this, but I believe that understanding what really went on with this particular type of explosion um, and upon which or we have forced unifying singular narratives from the outside is crucial to understanding what's happening geopolitically right now. It was a mistake to, to, to act as if, for example, Euromaidan was one about one thing or only had one moment. It had various moments with different participants and outcomes that were different than what these people wanted, but similar to what these people wanted, you know, for example. And one reason is that um, two of these uprisings, I think, are really unresolved. Um, I share the analysis that the horrifying land invasion of Ukraine in 2022 is still the what part of the unresolved consequences of, of Euromaidan. I think that the war really starts, Euromaidan becomes a, a civil war, which becomes a war in which Russia infiltrates anti-Maidan forces, which becomes a... Uh, 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 um, a full-blown war and then an ultimate land invasion. Like the Euromaidan is still unresolved. It's still happening, horrifying uh, in horrifying and, and, and um, tragic ways. People are dying right now. And I don't think that what is going on in Palestine right now is understandable without, under without um, paying very close attention to what happened. It didn't happen, especially in Egypt. I mean, this is so, that's just an image of the war in Ukraine. Uh, uh, but this is in, even though CC didn't want it to, a, a pro-Palestine demonstration did get to Tahrir Square um, late 2023, and a fundamental contradiction, I think, at the heart of the global system, and certainly one that haunts all the conversations in the Arab world about what is happening in Palestine, is that the people of the Arab world overwhelmingly support either ending relationships with Israel, or at the very least, want their representatives, the people that have been put in charge of representing them, to challenge the way that Israel is acting right now. You can't have, the global system currently dictates that that desire, which is overwhelming, like it's 95% in the case of Egypt, that that desire can never be realized by existing elites. Um, that the, the configuration of states that exist in the Arab world right now must maintain the power structure that came together often through um, U.S. support in the Cold War for Israel and Saudi Arabia. And this is a fundamental, I think, unresolved tension. Um, I, so I see certainly Egypt and most of the Arab Spring is also another unresolved um, um, episode from the mass protest decade. I'm negative one minute for, for this one. I'll do very, very quickly. For most of the book came out in October 2023. So for most of the following six months, when people ask me about what the Palestine protests had to do with um, my book, most of that time I said, it reminds me more of 2003. It reminds me of when I demonstrated against the invasion of Iraq. A lot of people around the real world were very effective at delivering a clear message to the people that mattered, the two men that mattered at the time, uh, George Bush and Tony Blair. They got that message, they ignored it. So one element that started to led me to say that, no, this actually is more reminiscent of the 2010s was the crackdown in Colombia, which led to a reproduction of that tactic across um, uh, the world, I think, including on this campus. Um, and that crackdown came, the, it was the crackdown that shocked people into that action. And again, it was a crackdown on a relatively privileged segment of the US population, you know, students, 
at an Ivy League university. So for better or worse, people in my class, people in the mainstream media in the United States are obsessed with university culture, especially obsessed with what's going wrong, possibly at elite universities. I think this is a class issue. It's where people in, in my profession want to something their kids or have kids enrolled. But you saw, and this, I'm going to try to finish here, an expression of a, a, the way that I often answer the question of what's changed is that there is some evolution in the ideas as to what is best practice in revolts, but the material conditions often remain the same. There is some evolution in the, in the thinking about what is the best way to try to create uh, um, a protest movement, but still the easiest thing to do remains that recipe that I outlined. Um, but that suspicion of media that I alluded to several times was reproduced, I think. And that turn to structure, that turn to some kind of an intentionality about organization was also introduced in so many of these encampments. And evidence of that was people from my profession, people from my class, being really upset that they couldn't do the thing that they were used to doing, which was to show up and then misrepresent <laughs> the movement. They were so used to doing that, they're like, well, why do you... Why are you directing me to your communications officer just like I would if you came to my house? Just like I would, like if you went to the Atlantic, of course I would not answer a question about, God, I don't know, I'm going to get in trouble. I'll direct you to the communications officer. The encampments had set up an intentional structure for dealing with these kind of inquiries and that it was, a, that, that was, I think, some evidence of ideas changing. But still, the material conditions remain the same. We remained very atomized. We remained, uh, uh, we, we remain trapped in communications, in, we trapped interacting with each other over communications networks uh, owned either by oligarchs like uh, Elon Musk, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, or being reported on by dominant media. So that is what I detected um, in, you know, business student comments and conversations with the students. And then Bangladesh, I think, is one, one example we're about to find out if these things, at least in this one case, um, this will go the way that I hoped it didn't back in Brazil uh, in June 2013. So thank you very much for listening. So you, you were talking about the Palestine encampments and the way the media wasn't able to engage because of the uh, communication directors kind of idea. Earlier in the talk, you talked about uh, pivoting tactics so that media misrepresentation can't change the actual fundamental nature of what's going on. Do you see any other obvious tactical changes that could be made so that these kinds of protests don't get steered by media? So I think that the shift to the intentionality of a communication strategy makes it harder <laughs> for misrepresentation to happen. It'll, it can still absolutely happen um, unless you either take control of existing media or create your own alternative media structures. Like you can be as organized and structured and intentional and disciplined as you want. Certainly the black the rights movement in the 50s and 60s learned that they'll lie about you in any, many ways, even if you have somebody to say this is what we stand for. So, I mean, those, again, like a lot of the other things in the book, this is easier said than done, but to have a strategy for interacting with existing dominant media structures, possibly to transform them and to have, uh, to employ, build um, your own megaphones, because it's often the people with the biggest megaphones in the global system that uh, define these narratives. And again, it was... It was both, right? Like it, what, like the crackdown shocked people, not because people were physically there, because they saw sympathetic representations of the crackdown on on media. So, um, uh, that potentially positive moment that comes from this strange position that Ivy League students have in the United States political um, discursive system still exists. But then, for that second moment, that those are my best answers. I guess, what are your thoughts on the recent right-wing protests and attacks? Um, I'm thinking of January 6th, but also January 8th in Brazil, the Faraz protests in Spain, and how they really tied into the alternate media sphere, or the fascist sphere down in Spain, stuff like that, and how those end up fueling the attacks, and mm -hmm. how that kind of relates to, well, previous protests. Right. So some people disagree with me here or don't like to talk about it, but I do think that those are kind of the same thing. Like January 6th and January 8th, do sort of belong in the long history of this type of revolt. I mean, of course they don't, they're not, of course they're not progressive. Of course they don't get over the line where they overthrow or fundamentally destabilize um, existing elites. But it is this kind of repeated repetition of a tactic without sort of some strategic analysis of how it's going to lead to 
um, some positive outcome. I think that there's two things that I learned from January 6th and January 8th. Um, one, that anybody can do anything. Like tactic, their tactics are ontologic. Like tactics are not morally privileged or inherently reactionary. Like anybody can do an assault. Anybody can block an airport, you know? Anybody can can march on a capital, right? Um, and that physically occupying the, sp the space doesn't necessarily do anything, right? Like you you can get in and and that doesn't and that doesn't change anything. Um, so I do think that it is well. Another now this is a little provocative. Another analysis I kind of only half share this is that um, Andre Mir, who's a media critic, talks about the ways in which we thought that stuff from the internet was progressive because like educated millennials got on the internet first in like the first half of the 2010s it was like my generation and like our analogs around the world like relatively urban relatively young relatively progressive people that were dominating conversations on facebook in the second half of the 2010s different different populations get on facebook baby boomers get on facebook older men get on facebook and the facebook inspired Facebook fueled revolutions, you know, a revolts then happen to be more reactionary. And I think um, I, I half agree with that, that view of like what we saw in the 20, in like in the, by the, because at the beginning of the 2010s, everybody, not everybody, a lot of the, the dominant media narrative was like, everything that happens on the internet is good by the 20, by certainly in like liberal media after 2016, the, that's the um, narrative with everything that happens on the internet is bad. Um, and often it was because it's just, just a different population was, was, was was discovering digital coordination and the reproduction of certain narratives on online. Dan, and then, and then, then we have one from the uh, virtual. Well, yeah, one at a time, right? So, um, to what extent do you think the ingredients in the recipe are you can mix and match or are interchangeable? Um, because it feels like some of them are pretty tightly coupled, like leaderless, horizontal, spontaneous, and yeah, yeah. in the minds of social movement participants, and some of them are not. Um, some of them are so close to link that you could even skip one or the other. Like horizontality is close to... Well, the thing about horizontality is that there is horizontality and there's one type horizontalism, which is a distinction I think is really important. I'm making the book, but I don't talk about it too much here. The difference between groups that believe that there should be horizontality, that believe that there should be no um, leaders, or in some extreme cases, even no division of labor within the group, that everyone should do everything and everything should be uh, decided by consensus. And other situations that are more concretely horizontal, I think Tucker Square in Egypt is one more like this, where even if there's a lot of subjective desire for the possibility of representation, the possibility of leadership, the possibility of some kind of a revolutionary agent. Just like in practice, there is no one that can step forward credibly and say, I represent, there's no mechanism for having representation. Um, and the reason that there's that distinction between horizontalism and horizontality and leaderlessness is that often you have horizontalism, but with leaders, unrecognized leaders, that, that, that comes that ends to that ends up being a major problem. You have enough horizontality, but then leaders impose, and then they say, "I'm the leader," and everyone says, "Like I can't." So certainly, those are mixed together. Spontaneity, I think, is separate. I think when we're talking about a group of people that had not decided to be involved in any kind of a political movement, deciding all very quickly to show up, that will add to horizontality. But again, even in the most structured, the classically organized revolutions. In history, you needed that element. So there's the distinction between whether or not there is only horizontality or like some movement of spontaneous people that then later, it's quite clear to everybody that that means that this, it's okay for this group to at least um, act in their name and see how it works out. Now, digital coordination is basically material. That's basically the rise of for-profit social media firms in the 2010s, organizing what you see on, on timelines in a very specific way, mass protest, I think is linked to leaderlessness, but it doesn't have to be. You can have absolutely have a mass protest that is tightly um, structured. You can have a you can have a mass, you can have a lot of people on the streets watching, watching Martin Luther King talk, talk, and without everyone having like a, a badge that says like I'm a college in the, Mar in the MLK movement, it's kind of understood that like we accept that he's um, someone we stand behind. But protest, um, I think, is is more material than ideological. It's, it, it it arises. And an era of mediation in the sense of media, um, 
So that one could be disaggregated too. And prefiguration, again, one that is linked, like the most, I guess the people that love it, love doing prefiguration all the time tend to be on the anti-authoritarian left, but even like Marx would have said that like Paris communist prefiguration, but he wouldn't have said that the party should prefigure um, the society we want to live in. And then floating signifier, I think is one that just was people trying to give a nice cool gloss on something that was, that appeared. So that's, yeah, I actually tried, I actually went through everything all in the I didn't need to. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, so it, it seems to me, if, correct me if this is too much of a generalization, that a lot of these 2010s destabilized protests often kind of lack a set of coherent demands, yes. either uh, by mistake or by disdaining the need for a state or a higher authority to make those demands too. Um, so wait, would you interpret it as, would you interpret it as those uh, protests kind of disdaining the, the, the state as a legitimate authority? And would you interpret the more recent protests, protest movements that have more organization and have more demands as recognizing that you, need, you sometimes need concessions from mm -hmm. an authority? I think that as like trend forecast and just kind of like watching what's in the air, I think that 2020s movements are less likely to reject demands for moral or political reasons. There, there's more of a, of, a, of a, there's less of a, a tendency to do that than you would have seen like in 2011, for example. Now, in the 2010s, sometimes there was an inability to produce demands because of horizontality. So there was like the government said, I mean, so there's a, there's a scene in the book that I really love, Dilma Rousseff, she comes up as a dissident. She doesn't want to be an anti-protest president. She doesn't want to come up with this narrative like the Putin has that everything is, is destabilizing and evil. She wants to, she wants to give the streets something. So she is forced to sit in the presidential palace and watch TV all day long. She turns off the sound because she doesn't want to be influenced by what the, the journalists from Global are saying. She knows that they're not her friends. So she just watches to see what the signs say because there's no way for the people on the streets to actually say, well, these are our seven demands. So she tries to figure out what they are. Mm -hmm. Now, the MPL is very interesting because they do have an anti-state set of instincts, but also, well, there's a lot of things that are interesting about MPL. Rodrigo Nunes will say that they're a horizontalist group that acts in, in the most vanguard fashion in certain moments, and that actually is when they're most effective. That they are in, insistent that they're horizontalists, but actually they close the lines and they make all the decisions as a small group and you're not allowed in. And when people try to get in, they don't know what to do. Um, and, and also another strange thing, interesting thing about them is that they do have an anti, a set of anti-state instincts, but their ultimate demand is for the state to provide free public transportation for everyone. So I do think that that, and they think this too, they also agree with this. They do think that that instinctual rejection of the state as the site of final struggle and the instinctual rejection of the of the, the of the rejection of the idea that anyone's allowed to say that any demand is better or worse than the others allowed for a slippage into a diffusion of demands which made it was ultimately uh illegible uh, yes uh, i'm a big advisor of uh, the jakarta methods and which i have here uh, <laughs> but i must admit i haven't read uh your more recent book and I, so i don't know if you have dealt with this but in the same time period my roots are in india there was a massive protest movement against corruption and against the brutal assault on a young woman in a new delhi bus right uh, initially it was uh, spontaneous and broad-based but it was co-opted by the right and now in retrospect observers say that this was it was one of the main reasons for the rise of Narendra Modi at right. the election. Right. So, um, and I, I'm not sure if you've dealt at all <laughs> with that in your uh, in your book. I really thank you for that for pointing me, for pointing us to that right now. I there's many many things that are like that, but story like illuminate some of the same things. Yes. I I I like set this bar really high. Like it didn't overthrow or you know Egypt didn't or sorry India didn't come to a standstill for a few okay. days. So the government was just days. Yeah yeah yeah. Okay. So I didn't clear the stop the standard that I'd set. But this type of thing. Again, I'll go back to Brazil. The the possibility that you can look back as because you pointed to what really caused this revolt, right? In the Brazilian context, and I'm just going to keep talking about it because it's the main case of the book, and I've talked about it so much today. If you ask Bolsonaristas now what 2013 
they will say that's the moment then that the right was reborn in Brazil. That's the moment that we stepped onto the scene and that we began to create a path to victory. That's where we were born. If you ask the MPL, they will say this was all about um, the demands for better public services, empowering working class struggle, and the rejection of police brutality. Both these narratives are right, even though they're completely contradictory. And that's the strange nature of this, I think, particular recipe is that you get counter contradictory outcomes, and there never is actually one, one. Uh, 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 one, one narrative that can be imposed coherently. You're always going to have another one which is contradictory. We have two questions on SEC from uh, our virtual audience, one from Joe Shermer. He writes, thank you, Vincent. I really appreciate your work. Um, in your view, can you um, discuss or, or and name other protest movements that have begun to transform into a more effective approach to seeking and acquiring power to make change? Mm -hmm. Um, and so take that one, and then uh, we'll go to um, Juliana, who will ask her own question. Yeah, I think that this is a question mark that hangs over, I think, the, the, uh, the pro-Palestine movement, right? I think that there is an intentionality, a desire to make it so that the pro-Palestine movement on campuses, but around the world, around the United States, exists as something other than the explosion of encampments that we saw in spring. Because if indeed there is something in the long term that can impose costs on university elites, on the government for betraying what they said they would do or for um, carrying out crimes of humanity against the Palestinian people, then it doesn't matter if the actual encampment goes away. So I think that's a question mark, mark that hangs over um, this moment. And I think there is, again, I think that the idea, like ideologically, there's a, a lot of desire to create something that is durable that can continually impose costs on the US state uh, in the long term. But again, the material conditions are, are, are the same and, with the, and, and, and these are difficult sets of conditions. Wonderful. Uh, now we'll turn to Juliana Shemides, who is, I'm gonna ask to unmute. Um, hi, Vincent. Hi, Adrian. Hi, everyone. Um, so good to be here, even though I'm very bummed that I am um, sick with COVID and not physically present with you. So wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you so much for throwing all of these really thought provoking ideas our way. My question loops back to the question that I think a student asked you a few beats earlier around demands. And I just wanted to have you elaborate on that a little bit, especially in light of this terrific slide you had up, which I need to quote literally. Um, so the, the brutal lesson slide from 2020, where you say this form generates effective destabilization, et cetera, um, and without various things, it amounts to a crapshoot. So the substance of my question has to do with demands and the crapshoot part. <laughs> sure. Then what I am wondering here is, you know, clearly this um, frustrating outcome that you describe did result in the victory in many, many cases of a new um, so-called populist brand of far-right politics, right? And so I'm curious about how your analysis meshes with that. And I wanted to just put forward one, it's not even a hypothesis, just one thing that came to mind as I was listening to you, which is, how much do the demands here really matter in terms of the their ability to be reappropriated by that far right populist uh, movement? In the sense that you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the fascism talk, but there there are certainly certain um, nationalist, xenophobic, welfareist demands that if you take away the nationalism and the xenophobia sound like demands for the expansion of a social state for more, um, you know, better health care, free public transportation, expanded public transportation, et cetera, et cetera, which, um, which are demands that we did hear from these left-wing movements in the street. Whereas, um, you know, other demands cannot be so easily reappropriated and, repackaged within a xenophobic anti-immigrant gift wrap paper. Um, so I'm wondering whether the demands themselves are predictive, maybe more predictive than, than we think in mm -hmm. terms of determining outcomes. And um, 
And then I also just wanted to loop back to ye old criticism of the new left, um, which is clearly not something that has emerged in the, you know, not a critique that has emerged in the past 10, 15 years, but um, that's been buzzing since the 1960s, which is that if you um, privilege horizontality and shun political power, you will get a mess and not um, and not bring about structural change. So I just kind of wanted to look back to that because it sounds like uh, not stated that dramatically or, you know, that nastily, but it sounds like a version of that is something that maybe some of the activists told you, um, possibly maybe, um, and or, you know, moving back to the far right populism, the far right populists had no problem inhabiting the contradictory position that someone like Donald Trump inhabits, which is, I'm against all politics, elect me as president right away. Right. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I, I'd love to hear you reflect in a less feverish and coherent manner than I just did <laughs> on some of these great themes. Thank you so much. No, thank you so much. That, that, that is a really useful set of interventions that allow me to actually point to sort of gaps in the, the talk that I, you know, I, I chose not to fill in so for the sake of time. But if we can go back to the slide that she mentioned, there's a, uh, without analysis of the surrounding conditions or additional elements. So that's a big hole right there. It amounts to a crapshoot, right? So you um, Juliana, spoke a lot about demands. So when we're in the field of demands, we're still in the field where it's actually the elites that are deciding, right? And so if you have demands upon elites, but without the ability to impose real costs on them in the long term, then it's really up to them. And then you can kind of get this picking of choosing of what serves their purposes or what they can get away with. And this is crucial. And this comes up a lot in the 20th sense, what they can get away with without actually taking any privileges away from themselves or their friends. Often what we saw in the 2010s is a diffuse set of demands. You get a mixing in of demands that are very hard to deliver on and quite easy to deliver on. So they deliver on the culture war stuff. So this is part of Volodymyr Vyshenko's analysis of Yuri Maidan, for example. The people in the square, first, the first wave, wave one, was a set of largely like NGO employees facing West, wanting to join, European, join the European Union. Phase two, after the crackdown, there was huge amounts of regular people they were different from this um, social milieu. Not that there's anything wrong with um, looking to the West. These are people that share probably a lot of the views that are common um, in this room or in the United States. But the new set of people that uh, entered the square, they often had economic demands. They wanted de-oligarchization. They wanted a country which is not in constant decline as it had been since the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, but there was also a nationalist element in the square. It was clearly there. I don't think, you know, those people with economic de demands wouldn't have said that it was dominant, but it was certainly there. The actual resolution effects a game of musical chairs in which other oligarch-backed elites ignore all the economic stuff, because that would mean taking away money from themselves, and they hype up the nationalist thing so they could say that they're doing something that the streets asked for. So without the additional elements, without some kind of organizational form, some kind of a movement that will impose costs long-term on a set of existing elites, um, then you're leaving it up to them to, to pick and choose. And this will um, um, usually be the things that have no, uh, for which there are no losers in the ruling class, right? But also that's the, the question about demands is still, we're still in the field of letting the elites decide. Because often what came up in the 2010s was the op real opportunity for you to decide. There was actually a moment where certain organizational forms, had they been available, could have entered a real vacuum or like not, you know, the whole state, but there was enough of a, of a fracture in the state that you could have entered and made yourself part of the decision-making process. Well, you don't have to join the state, but make yourself part of the uh, decision-making process. And then the types of additional elements that people choose, which are the context, context dependence, so I didn't go into it. Some people around the world think that union organization is important. Some people get involved in parliamentary politics. Sometimes some people think that a revolutionary party is important. Some people think that social movements are important. Um, but it is that, that element is missing of the, that, that makes that makes it a crapshoot. If you don't look around at who's willing to, who's going to take advantage of opportunities, and it's not you, then it's a crapshoot. But ideally, you can make it you. A lot of people at the end of the, a lot of interviewees come to the conclusion, well, actually, there's, I don't want to press that destabilization button right now. I think it would be bad for me in my country right now. But still, history might come knocking without me being planned for it. So the creation of 
um, some kind of those, some kind of that additional elements are is worth it no matter what happens, because they allow us to make more effective demands, to impose costs for not delivering on those demands, and to act when the unexpected arises. And I think this is uh, an unintention unintentional, perhaps you did sort of come in this direction, overlap with that old critique of the new left, the really famous essay, uh, The Tyranny of Structurelessness, uh, always comes up in these discussions of the idea that if you insist that there's no structure, you will get one anyways, but it'll be a structure you didn't choose. And then that critique of the new left, that if you have structurelessness, you get a mess. But I think this, if you look at, I, you know, I asked one of those questions at the end of the, 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 the question mark pro-systemic movements is, well, what did the new social movements get? And I think we, I think that they got a lot. You know, I think it's pretty well recognized that um, gains for women's, minority, women, women's, women's, women's rights groups, minorities, uh, 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 um, LGBT rights, these kinds of things were part of the um, larger package of the real gains that were um, achieved through the new social movements that were associated in that old, very schematic um, description um, by Wallerstein in the 1990s. But also, that's all stuff that didn't like overthrow or really challenge existing economic elites. That kind of stuff didn't get in the way of the accumula accumulation of capital. It's good, it's important, it just as Wallerstein was back then. Um, those movements should be proud of all of that. But when it comes to like, and this is something that I was told quite explicitly, bringing into Egypt now a form that relies on sort of the ultimately, relies on a set of elites that won't just kill you if you get in the way, relies on the, relies on the ultimate accession to the new order by a, an existing set of elites. Then the question of, are you letting elites pick and choose starts to really matter because in the case of like, you know, Libya, they might just, Kill everyone. Um, I think that uh, that is my best answer to the very real and deep problem. Just as you, I think that the new populist right, just like here on this slide, hopefully, um, the new the new populist right does respond to somehow or another the crisis of representation, the anti political instinct, the anti political urge. Like I'm against every. I'm not part of the system. Make me uh, the king. Uh, is a response to very real questions, very real problems, but it's the wrong answer. Um, again, Bolsonaro was like a really classic. When he was stabbed, like this clip is very um, famous um, because it affected the, 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 the campaign, but the, the shirt he's wearing as he's stabbed is, it says, my party is Brazil. Basically, he's like, I'm not doing politics. I'm just elevating myself above the entire nation to lead it. Well, like, yeah, well, that's politics of a different type. Uh, it's a very dangerous type. But I think that like these political explosions, like these, these explosions that I think are often anti-systemic in content, um, that right populism responds to the crisis representation and only worsens it.